weeks because of the drought. <laughs> she describes that her fans. Hello everyone and welcome to Dutch Greybeard. In this video I would like to look back at my reading year of 2022. In that year I read shockingly few books. This is partly due to my extremely busy working schedule at the time. Another reason is that I started on the first leg of my pilgrimage to Rome. Not that I'm a religious person, but as everyone does a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, I of course had to do something else, so I chose Rome as my end point. On June the 15th I started out on my journey. Because of bad preparations I had to give up on the 20th already, only five days in. My feet were completely covered in blisters so walking had become virtually impossible. I took some time to recover and to prepare better, and I began my second attempt on July the 27th. I walked for 10 days, which sums up the total to 15 days and 330 kilometers. This brought me from my hometown, Heemskerk, to Roermond in the south of the Netherlands. During this whole period of time, from beginning of June to about halfway through August, reading books was the last thing on my mind. During those three summer months, I read only three books. Altogether, this whole year, I read 21 books, 10 of which were in Dutch. Of the 11 books in the English language I read, six were thrillers four times Steve Berry and two times James Rollins. Two were children's books by Arthur Ransom and I read one classic novel and two non-fiction books. There are two books of my entire 2022 list that I would like to highlight. For this video I'll uh, leave it at one book which is Landlines by Raina Wynn. Oh, like this. I have to tell you that there will be some spoilers up ahead, so if you're on the brink of reading this book, now would be a good time to stop watching this video. I will not give away the entire plot or uh, miraculous endings. This is her first book, The Salt Path, which made her instantly famous. This is her second, The Wild Silence. And the book that I'm going to be talking about mainly this time is Landlines. After her first book, The Salt Path, I could not imagine Raina Wynne writing another book. Her story was told, or so I thought, let alone that a sequel would be just as good or even better than her debut. But The Wild Silence was equally captivating. And now there is her third book, and there's even a fourth on the way. Without any hesitation, I can call this book a masterpiece. It transcends its two predecessors, which were already of an exceptionally high level. Win accounts of her near desperate search for hope in a style and language that have continued to mature. She doesn't explain anything, she just tells. Well, just what a writer this woman is. In the Salt Path, the story revolves mainly around their homelessness, and the illness of Moth, Raina's husband, plays second fiddle. He's been diagnosed with cortibasal degeneration. That's not how you pronounce that. Cortibasal degeneration? Well, it's a neurological disorder affecting motor skills, memory, speech and swallowing. There is no cure, 
but like many Parkinson's related disorders, it has only one cause, a steady decline until death. This threat is certainly present in her debut, but mainly as something that lies ahead in some distant future. This is already different in her second book, which shows that his illness has worsened. Despite the positive effects the long distant walking had in the first book, Moth continues to decline. Yet in the wild silence, Moth's cause of illness is overshadowed by the death of Rainer's mother. In the beginning of Landlines, the third book, Wynne describes how Moth wakes up at night because he can't breathe anymore. The left side of his body is paralyzed and he has to crawl to the toilet. Moth believes this is the end, but Ray disagrees. No, no, it won't happen to you. It's just the moment. It'll pass. For fuck's sake, Ray, listen to me. I can't keep fighting. Won't you just listen to me? It seems that the disease he had fought for so long was wrapping its powerful arms around him, no longer just hugging him, but tightening its grip and beginning to squeeze. As they both lie on the floor crying, Moth makes a light-hearted comment that at least he won't go further than the bathroom this time. Ray helps him crawl to the bathroom. It was obvious, even in the darkness, that we were in danger of losing our balance on the narrow fence that stands between comedy and tragedy. Everything Wynne writes has meaning, or the reader can discover meaning in everything she writes. This already starts in a prologue on the first page, where the author describes how she dared not take a step forward or backward during their hike on a mountain during a rainstorm. If she makes one more move, she will lose her balance and fall into the depths. But for a moment when I look up, I can see another world, a world of blue sky, where a hooded crow glides silently beneath slow moving clouds. This is Landlines in a nutshell. The situation is hopeless, but there is still a last glimmer of light somewhere. Right after Wynne sees that world with the blue sky, Moth takes the initiatives and walks ahead of her. He takes her hand and leads her to a safer place. Although he is sick, he helps her. The prologue closes with this sentence. Hope rises in the evening dew and takes flight with a thousand crane flies into the air. Everything in Rainer Wynne's prose is right. Almost every sentence is a feast of language and every scene touches me as a reader. After the prologue, we go back in time. Moth begins to accept that the end of his life is near, but Ray categorically refuses to accept this and continues to look against better judgment for ways out, for possibilities that can trigger a turnaround in Moth's disease process. They've done that before by walking the southwest coast path right after losing their home, so why not do it again? Moth hardly eats anymore and sleeps most of the time. His hands shake. It shouldn't be this way. This man who had run marathons, climbed mountains, reached for the sun throughout his life, shouldn't be taking a sandwich from a box with a hand that shakes the pickle from the cheese. Not the hand that has held mine for 40 years of wild and tangled life, steady, sure, and so entwined that I can no longer tell where my hand ends and his begins. Heartbreaking. Raynor observes two seagulls as tears run down her cheeks because of the reality she is confronted with. But as I look up, two herring gulls lift into the grey skies, stretching their powerful wings, letting the wind direct them, 
and I can almost smell the salt air that calls them. A typical rain or wind sentence, which at first glance looks like a description of two birds, but on a deeper level expresses her desire to walk, her desperate search for hope. Ray knows that Moth always wanted to hike the Cape Wrath Trail, but never got around to it. She manipulates him in such a way by placing books ostentatiously that the seed is planted in his head and he eventually indicates that he wants to walk the trail. He knows that Ray is manipulating him, but apparently there's still something in him that doesn't want to give up. Throughout most of their hike and bike ride, which will eventually take four months and cover thousand miles, Ray feels guilty for pretty much having forced Moth into this arduous journey, especially in the beginning of their journey, when she sees how her love is in pain and wants to give up regularly. During their preparations and the first conversations on the trail, they tell people of their plan and everyone without exception thinks they're crazy. These people don't even know about Moth's advanced disease. They only know that the Cape Wrath Trail is one of the toughest trails in the UK. It starts at Cape Wrath in the far northwest of mainland Scotland. From the outside, it's an idiotic plan in every way. But Moth and Ray nevertheless embark on the adventure. Not because they no longer have a home and need compels them, but because the yearning for hope drives them onward. Their journey is an exercise in trial and error. Much, much trial and error. Ray feels guilty watching Moth flounder and suffer. One of the things Moth says is, no matter how much you force me to keep going, you know as well as I do that this illness has gone too far. The original plan is to walk from Cape Wrath to Fort William. However, Cape Wrath is inaccessible due to military exercises. So they start a little further south in Shigra and rename the trail to Shigra Trail. Despite their desperation, they keep walking. Ray with huge blisters from wearing the wrong shoes, the overtired moth with pain all over his body. She hides her blisters from moth but he sees it anyway. Don't do that, he says indignantly. Don't hide things because they don't feel as important as me fucking dying. Moth gets stronger and as described in the prologue, he helps Ray on the mountain. They arrive in Fort William and when Ray tells them to take the train back home to Cornwall, he suddenly says he's thought about it. I'm not ready to stop. Instead, he suggests walking a different trail from Fort William. It's 96 miles. That's 10 days at most. And so it goes every time. At the end of the West Highland Way, they pick up their bikes and continue their route on two wheels. Ray, despite her blisters, is not happy about this. Suddenly, completely untrained muscle groups are being tested to their limit. After that, they walk the Pennine Way with their good friends Dave and Julie. When they arrive at a restaurant starving, Dave orders a dainty portion of salmon and salad in an attempt to prove Julie just how sophisticated he can be. Later on, at a supermarket, Julie covertly buys a big bag of sausage rolls. When Rayner warns her that they are heavy to carry, Julie explains, he's going to be really hungry later and I can produce them just when he's starting to feel sorry for himself. A good marriage, apparently, because when night has already fallen, Ray overhears their dialogue. Don't know why I had that salmon, I'm bloody starving. But you could eat a sausage roll. What's the matter with you, woman? Do you just enjoy torturing me? Well, yes, but I do have a sausage roll if you want one. What? Oh, yes, 
I bloody love you. Unlike when she walked the southwest coast path, as described in the salt path, Raina Wynne is no longer an unknown wanderer. As a celebrated writer, she's occasionally recognized along the way. One of her readers says Ray's book has changed her life. Ray denies that. The book might have given you an idea, but it didn't change your lives. Books don't change lives. They can change how you think, but it's you that changed your life. Only towards the end of their months long hike, they prepare the bag of dried potato powder they had been carrying with them all this time, along with a can of tuna. All the while that powder didn't exactly appeal to them, but they love it. Moth looked at his fork, then at me, and raises his eyebrows. Why haven't we eaten this before? It's actually really good. Wow, when I think of all the noodles we've eaten, then we discover this on the last day. He looks at the horizon, then back at me. A long look that has nothing to do with potatoes. That last sentence is typical Rainer Wynn. It puts the reader on a profound track without interpreting it. At the end of the Pennine Way, Ray observes Moth and sees how muscular he has become, and his hands are no longer shaking. But more so, there is a light in his face that was lost in the dark fog of his encroaching illness. It's the light of hope, of possibility, of the desire to keep trying. She continues in what is one of the most beautiful declarations of love I've ever read. But as I watch him scoop the peas off his plate and they stay on the fork until they reach his mouth, I know I'll follow the light of this man no matter where it leads. When they finally exchanged the heavy Scottish highlands for the flatter English landscape, walking becomes easier. Muth grows stronger every day and his old gusto for life returns. They try to stretch the last miles to Paul Rouen, where they live, as long as possible, afraid to end this healing journey in which hope was once again given a chance. Muth says they walked more than he ever thought possible. I feel like we've climbed a mountain I didn't know was there, but I'm at the top now and I'll never come down. Yes, I am a fan. Raina Wynn revealed in an interview that she's signed a contract for a fourth book. She's the kind of writer whose books I will keep on buying unseen because she is simply incapable of making anything bad. Everything that springs from her pen is gold. Like the following sentence, after they have been walking in the pouring rain for days. Water drives under hoods, through leggings, into boots, until we're so saturated we stop thinking about being wet and simply become the water. At the end of the salt path it becomes clear that although the walking has done him good, Moth has not been miraculously cured. That would have been too magical. The afterword of Landlines consists of three pages. I'll leave these to the reader, otherwise the spoiler would be too big. Thank you very much for watching this video and please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Until we meet again at Dutch Greybeard.